It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Speaker, women have been silenced in the courts, and yesterday women were silenced in this House. The MPP for Waterloo tabled Lydia's Law, which would have helped increase accountability and transparency in the handling of sexual assault cases in Ontario. The government shut it down. Hundreds of survivors and advocates and crisis support workers were expecting a chance to get answers on why this government has allowed so many sexual assault cases to be dismissed before trial. More than 1,300 cases of sexual assault in 2022 alone never saw a trial because the court system is so deeply underfunded and overwhelmed. Those are not just numbers, Speaker. These are survivors, survivors who are not going to get a shot at justice. So to the Premier, why are you silencing survivors of sexual assault who deserve justice from our legal system? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Speaker. In fact, nothing could be uh, further from the truth. Uh, as the Leader of the Opposition would know that uh, what we voted on yesterday uh, was in principle sending the bill directly to a uh, committee of the legislature. The, in fact, all progressive conservatives, and I would suggest that probably all members of this, uh, of this House, wanted to see that bill sent directly to committee so that it could be part of the study that the Justice Committee is doing on intimate partner violence. I remind, I remind the legislature. I remind the legislature that this, this legislature agreed that we should study that and come back with comprehensive uh, uh, recommendations on how we can provide better services to victims of intimate partner violence. As you know, a uh, former uh, Crown uh, prosecutor is leading those efforts on behalf of the government side at the committee, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and it is, my, it, is, it is certainly my expectation that that committee will continue to do really good work, bring back recommendations here, and that we can provide real solutions for those of it. The supplementary question, Member Waterloo. Thank you. The House Leader knows full well that if the government was going to vote for that bill, it would have ended up in Justice Committee anyway. Right. Months ago, Speaker, a young woman named Lydia and her mother came to me and they shared their experience of navigating Ontario's broken justice system. It took Lydia two years to get justice. She told me that she did not want any other survivor to go through what she went through and asked what I could do to help. I learned through stakeholder consultations just how broken and underfunded and re-traumatizing the justice system is for survivors. Lydia's story represents the story of so many survivors in, in Ontario. Speaker, sexual violence disproportionately impacts women, girls, and gender diverse people. To the Attorney General, you have silenced survivors in the court system, and now you are silencing female voices in the legislature. What are you hiding from? Take seats. Remind members to make their comments through the chair. Government House Leader. Thank you. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, in her opening comments, the, the member opposite, uh, frankly, uh, uh, identifies that the bill would go to the exact same committee that we expedited the bill to uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker. We were very clear that we thought that this bill, there are very important elements in the, the private member's bill that, uh, that the member brought forward, but we are having undertaking right now a very comprehensive study into the uh, uh, the challenges facing uh, uh, victims of, uh, of intimate partner uh, violence, uh, Mr. Speaker. The committee, the Justice Committee, which is uh, on our part uh, being led by a former uh, uh, Crown prosecutor, uh, is to provide recommendations to this legislature, to the government, on how we can make the system better, how we can make those who provide services for victims of intimate partner violence uh, better, how we can improve the justice system. We want to also ensure that the federal Spons. government that the federal government understands how important this issue is to the people of the province of Ontario. We're not silencing anyone, Mr. Speaker. In fact, what we're doing is showing how important it is and expediting that work, and the committee will continue to do that work, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary, the member for Waterloo. Debate in this House is a key part of our democracy. Lydia wanted the debate to happen. She wanted to hear from the government. She wanted to hear from us, and she deserved to be heard. Speaker, if this government won't listen to me, maybe they'll listen to Lydia's mother. 
She said, and I quote, the most difficult thing a parent can ever experience is watching your child suffer. Throughout the over two-year court process for this trial, my daughter's mental health suffered immensely due to court backlogs. With every delay, every setback in court, my daughter's mental health deteriorated. She was re-victimized. She was traumatized over the course of those two years, in which during this period of time, the accused, who was found guilty of all change charges, was free to live his life. But not Lydia. To the Attorney General, why are you attempting to silence voices like these and trying to prevent them from getting the justice that they deserve in this legislature, in this province? To be uh, clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, I thought it was very important uh, that that bill be referred directly to committee uh, because we are undertaking a very in-depth study on intimate partner violence uh, uh, through the legislative assembly, through the Justice Committee of the Legislative Assembly. As I said, the member for Kitchener South Hespler, a former Crown Prosecutor, is leading the efforts on behalf of the government of Ontario uh, on that committee, Mr. Speaker. What we want to see, what are the obstacles that are being faced? We know that there are obstacles in the courts because the federal government seems somehow unable to appoint judges to the bench, Mr. Speaker, which is causing delays, but there's more to it on that than that, Mr. Speaker. We want to talk to the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. We want to talk to the Minister of uh, uh, Family and Children's Services, to the Minister of Housing, across government to see what obstacles can we remove, how can we work better together, Lawrence. are there provinces that are doing things better than, uh, than we are doing, and how can we make changes that will provide victims of uh, intimate partner violence real, real change so that they can move forward, Mr. Speaker. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. I'll tell you, Speaker, no one is buying that. No one is buying what they're selling. I'll tell you. And I cannot tell you how disappointing this is for everybody here. Uh, let's talk about another disappointing issue. Uh, while the Minister of Health dismisses and minimizes the doctor's shortage in this province, the CEO and president of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, CHEO, says that their hospital has lost dozens of pediatric physicians since this government took office. CHEO is struggling uh, to provide the early intervention that our kids need because we know that it makes a world of difference for our children. Does the Premier agree with his minister, who thinks vacancies at children's hospitals are not a major concern? Please take their seats. Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health and member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario has some of the shortest wait times across the country, but we know there's more to be done. That's why this last summer we announced our government is investing an additional $330 million each year for over 100 high-priority pediatric care initiatives across the province. Speaker, I was at that announcement at CHEO because that is my local hospital, and I will quote the CEO of CHEO, the biggest children's health funding announcement in provincial history, Speaker. This would help unleash creative forces for children and youth organizations all across this province, Speaker. This investment includes hiring more pediatric surgical staff to increase the amount of day surgeries and increase access to diagnostic procedures for children. Speaker, we are ensuring children and youth in every corner of this province can connect to the care they need when they need it. Speaker, Our increase in pediatric surgeries has been supported by our government, doubling pediatric ICU capacity at both McMaster and CHEO. Speaker, we are taking the bold and innovative action to ensure Ontarians Response. can connect to the care they need when and where they need it. Speaker. Supplementary question. You know, Speaker, I shouldn't have to tell this government how unique CHEO is. It is one of the only, uh, it has one of only two level one pediatric trauma units in Ontario. Wait times for MRIs and ultrasounds at CHEO are now the longest in Ontario. We have sick little kids transported out of the region, even out of the province, to get care. Parents taking time off work. Brothers and sisters taking time off school. Little kids separated from their families and their friends while they're getting treatment. Why? Because of the doctor shortage that this government and that minister refuses to even acknowledge, let alone fix. So back to the Premier. 
Is this a major enough concern for his minister yet? Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, I'm very proud of the work that they're doing at CHEO, and I'm extremely proud of the extra $330 million that we invested into CHEO last year, Speaker. It took Ontario years of neglect by the previous governments that were supported by the NDP, right. unfortunately, and we're fixing those mistakes that they've taken, Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition actually voted against our historic $330 million investment, but she doesn't mention that in the House, Speaker. Screening and overall surgical wait lists have declined to below pre-pandemic level, Speaker, with nearly 80 per cent of all Ontarians receiving their surgery within the target time. Speaker, the number of pediatric surgeries taking place is up by over 30 per cent of what surgeries were last year, with three of the five Ontario pediatric hospitals operating close to or near 100 per cent. Speaker. With our Your Health Plan, we're growing our health care workforce to ensure Ontarians can access the care they need for now and for years to come. Speaker, I will remind the House, for a decade the NDP prop up the Liberals, and that's why we're The final supplementary. Leave it up. Six long years, Speaker, six long years that this government's been in power, and they're still blaming everybody else for their failures. Like, just own up to it. All you need to do is look at their own numbers, Speaker. 3,000 physician vacancies right now across the province, right? A growing population, more physicians leaving the province every single day. And here's the problem. A child is sick. They can't get treated because there aren't enough doctors. Listen to the CEO and president of CHEO, for goodness sake. And what I and parents across the entire province are hearing from this Minister of Health is that this is not a major concern. Not a major concern. If the people of Ontario cannot trust this minister to acknowledge the extent of the crisis in our primary care system, how can the Premier trust her to solve it? Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Healthcare workers across the province have not forgot about Ray Days, Speaker. And I know the Leader of Opposition really doesn't like me to bring it up, but she was Order. a staffer in the Ray government, Speaker, oh. as well as some of their other caucus members, Speaker. It does take Order. time to reverse the poor Liberal policies, Speaker. Unfortunately, the NDP cut the amount of residency seats by 10 per cent. Speaker, the Liberals cut 50 seats. Sure. We are going to continue making those investments, Speaker, that are needed to ensure that our health care system functions properly after 15 years of Liberal NDP coalition that put us into this in the first place. Order. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Scrape at the bottom of the barrel there. Uh, since this question won't do anything, uh, this government won't do anything for CHEO and their physician shortage, let's talk about Gray County. Local residents are here today in the hope of finally, finally getting some answers from this government. They are losing all of their inpatient beds at Durham Hospital, meaning that patients um, can't be kept overnight, Speaker. Not only that, their emergency room is going to be permanently shut after 5 p.m. We've been raising this with the government for years now. Uh, the community has experienced rolling closures in Chesley, in Concordia, in Walkerton, and uh, Durham hospitals. For a month, their local councils have been asking the Minister of Health for a meeting. I mean, a call. Frankly, any explanation for any of this. But what they got? Silence. So my question is to the Premier, will the Premier question. do what the Minister will not and commit to meeting with the people of Grey County today? The Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health, Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Most, I think it's worth noting the hard work that the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound has been doing on this file, both meeting with his community and the Ministry of Health. 
Speaker, the South Bruce Gray Health Centre is governed by a local board of directors to best serve their local community needs. Speaker, when reviewing their community needs, they've decided to refocus their resources at Durham Hospital to primary care and urgent care. Speaker, this will result in expansion of care beds at Walkerton and Concordia hospitals as Durham shifts to primary care and urgent care. Speaker, with many patients in the Durham region community without a family physician, this focus will be imperative. South Bruce Gray Health Centre, Speaker, changes will have no impact on the level of care Order. while retaining the existing staff. These changes will ensure a stable and sustainable health care system Response. that will better serve the local needs. Speaker, the Ministry of Health, Ontario Health and South Bruce Gray Health Centre will continue to work together for longer-term solutions to health care in South Bruce Gray. The supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Just to make sure that we understand, we're talking about the town of Durham, not the region. Yeah. Those good people are here today. We've seen this all before, Speaker. With the closure of Minden Hospital last June, this government starved rural hospital an emergency room with chronic <coughs> underfunding. They blame the workers, they blame the community, they blame everything but themselves. After being ignored and dismissed by this government, when the community of Minden asked for help, their local hospital officially closed their door last June. The good people of Durham are here today. They are living the same nightmare that Minden lived last year. Will the Premier ensure the good people of Durham that their hospital will stay open? Let's be clear, Speaker. We blame the NDP propping up the Liberals for over 10 years as to why we're in this situation. Order. Speaker, our government inherited a health care sister a health care system under severe pressure due to the actions of the previous Liberal government. Under the leadership Order. of Premier Ford, our government has made record investments into the health care system. Speaker. Since 2018, Speaker, we've increased the health care budget by over $18 billion, investing over $85 billion into the system this Order. year alone. Speaker. Speaker, we will continue to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system all across Canada with our investments into our system. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy. The inflation affordability concerns Ontarians are facing right now are a direct result of the federal carbon tax. They are paying higher taxes and higher costs for the necessities of life, like food, gas, and housing, and it is only getting worse from here. Families need a break, Speaker. However, the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal caucus are supporting their federal buddies that want to keep punishing Ontarians. That's unacceptable. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is working for the people while the Liberals are punishing them with higher taxes? Minister of Energy. I can. Uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question this morning. Uh, the federal government has imposed this torturous uh, federal carbon tax on the people of Ontario and the people across Canada, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we know that the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, is happy to have this carbon tax in place. And her counterpart federally, Minister Gibo, uh, her buddy on Parliament Hill, has said that the queen of the carbon tax is happy to have that federal carbon tax in place, uh, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker. We know, we know that uh, the caucus here supports that increased tax and what it's doing to drive up the cost of everything. The NDP supports that tax as well, and, and the Green Party leadership here uh, supports that as well. Now, now, they're asking what's the plan, Mr. Speaker. The plan is powering Ontario's growth. Now, I want them to hear this. I want them to hear this. Last night, I was speaking at the Net Zero Forum put on by the Transition Accelerator. They applaud our plan, which is reducing emissions and growing our province's economy. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Since the introduction of this regressive tax, the cost of people's everyday essentials has reached a new high. Businesses are raising prices to keep up with costs. Families are cutting back on groceries, and seniors are worried about being able to afford heating fuel. Contrary to what the Liberal members in this House believe, the carbon tax is not in the best interests of Ontarians. Speaker, people are looking to our government to keep costs low and deliver real energy solutions. Last week, we concluded the largest battery storage procurement in Canada's history to meet growing electricity demand. Speaker, can the minister please explain why initiatives like this procurement deliver better results than a costly carbon tax? The Minister of Energy. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the great question. We are doing a lot. She referenced the massive uh, energy procurement last week for storage. Uh, the largest storage facility is actually going to be in the riding of our, our good member from uh, the riding that's way too long to mention, but from the Brockville uh, region, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that's going to ensure that uh, there is secure, reliable electricity in eastern Ontario for future growth, the kind of growth that we saw yesterday with Asahi Kasi. Uh, I said that wrong, but the Minister of Economic Development is going to support me on this. It was an almost $2 billion announcement down in the Niagara region yesterday, building on the $43 billion of new investment that we've seen across the province. Our Powering Ontario's Growth Plan is working. Even the environmental organizations that I met with last night at the Transition Accelerator are endorsing the Powering Ontario's Growth Plan because we're reducing emissions, providing reliable clean power for our province, and watching our economy grow at the same time. Thank you. The next question. The member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Your government has failed to implement the Canada-wide Early Learning Child Care Program. Child care operators, stakeholders, advocacy groups have been raising red flags that your minister has not delivered the $10, child, $10 a day child care spaces that were promised. Ola, a child care provider, pulled out of the program citing broken funding model. Everyone wants to know where the money is being spent. Your budget doesn't even mention the word child care. Will the Premier commit to requesting an Auditor General provide a full report of the government's spending on the $10 a day child care program? Damn, that's good. Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, we took action to sign a better deal with the federal government. The members opposite urged this government to sign the first deal available that would have precluded 30 per cent of the market, 70,000 spaces. The member opposite asked me today why operators aren't receiving support, and yet they wanted us to remove the ability of government to fund 30 per cent of our operators who are for-profit child care uh, owners, often women that run these businesses, often one or two operations. So you got to pick a lane. You can't argue we need more capacity and then single-handedly urge the government to deny 30 per cent of families access to this program. We are standing up for flexibility and affordability. We are delivering on our commitments, but the one challenge we face is the federal government has imposed a ceiling on growth because of an ideological adherence, the same one the NDP seems to champion today. Stand up for families, support choice. Every parent in Ontario just order. The supplementary question. That's not what we're hearing on this side of the House, and maybe if this government actually listened to some productive uh, uh, changes to the, the child care file, we'd actually get the spaces built. But families, Speaker, families are paying the price for this minister's lack of action and his failure to implement the $10 a day child care spaces. Wait lists keep growing, and parents can't access affordable child care. Families have lost trust in this government's ability to deliver affordable child care. This government won't even publicly report on how many of the 41 child care spaces they created in 2019 that are subsidized spaces. They won't even report on that. This government has not met with their own advisory group on the funding issue since last June. Families and child care providers want to know 
when this, why this government continues to hide, and when will they finally come up with a funding formula that will work for kids? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, our Premier's commitment to affordable child care is a sharp contrast to the Liberals. When it increased by 500 per cent under former Premier Wynne, it was Premier Ford who delivered a 50 per cent reduction. You want to benchmark success. Six to ten thousand dollars a child in the bank per year, and we're just at 50 per cent. We're going to keep going down and keep reducing rates. We've increased tens of thousands of spaces, 31,000 spaces within our schools, and members opposite should make it aware to the families watching that you oppose the expansion of spaces and the reduction of fees and you actually would have made it worse order wait lists would have been longer speaker because the opposition wants to impose i blind order. adherence to ideology instead of standing up for every single parent in ontario and so the opposition should get on board with what every parent Response. instinctively knows child care was too expensive under liberals it's finally more affordable under our progressive conservative government <laughs> Order. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The member for Leeds Grenville, Rideau Lakes, and Thousand Islands. So, thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. The Liberals continue to tell Canadians that their carbon tax is the only way to fight climate change. But the people of Ontario know that by paying more for gas and groceries, uh, it's not fighting climate change. Um, in fact, in my riding of Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes, all we have to do is look across the St. Lawrence River, south of the border, to our biggest trading partner, the United States. They don't have a carbon tax. But yet, they managed to have greater emission reduction than Canada. So, Speaker, my question to the minister is, please explain why the Liberal approach to fighting, the, uh, fighting climate change through the carbon tax is a misguided approach. And to respond, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, any tax hikes are misguided. Look at what our government is doing. Yesterday, we welcomed a $1.6 billion investment from Asahi Kase to build an EV separator plant in Port Coburn. Now, we've now landed $43 billion in new EV investments in the last four years. That is more than any U.S. state. Now, these investments are creating tens of thousands of good-paying jobs right across our province. How, Speaker? Because we reduced taxes right across the province. We've lowered the cost of doing business by $8 billion each and every year. <laughs> Speaker, we've shown the Liberals the way. Lowering taxes Spons. is how you bring wealth to an economy. Ax the tax. Supplementary, the member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Thanks, Speaker. The Liberals need to scrap the carbon tax. Here, here. It doesn't matter where you go in Ontario, especially in my riding of Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. The tax is virtually opposed by every worker and every business uh, across our country. No one wants to pay more for gas, shelter, or groceries. And while Ontario's economy, as you noted, Minister, has made significant progress since we took office, just imagine what we could do in Ontario if the Liberals scrapped the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister explain our approach to economic growth and how it's so, so different from the Liberal approach? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario remember what life was like under the Liberals. Now, they said in their economic statement, quote, they wanted to restructure the composition of our economy by wiping out manufacturing sector and transitioning the economy to a fully dependent service sector. Now, they drove up taxes to crush Ontario's manufacturing sector, and they chased out 300 thousand jobs by doing that. Now, Speaker, we took the opposite approach. We have lowered taxes in Ontario. We have cut red tape. We have lowered electricity rates. And that's why 700,000 more men and women are working today 
and manufacturing employment is now the highest level in 15 years. Speaker, the Liberal agenda of high Spons. taxes does not work. Our message is very clear. Scrap the carbon tax today. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Minister, auto theft is happening every day across this province. Car thieves are gaming the system and are able to get new VINs for stolen vehicles at Service Ontario counters. This government has reportedly been getting advice from current and former law enforcement and insurance experts about how to prevent re-VINing. This is more than a loophole. It's a highly lucrative scam that this government knows about but isn't fixing. So my question is, why is it so easy in Ontario to get stolen vehicles legitimized with a new VIN? Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Cambridge. Speaker, there is no reason people should live in fear of their cars being stolen or their homes being burglarized. That's why our government is using all the tools available to immediately put an end to the increase in auto theft. At our ministry, we have implemented many security measures with Service Ontario. All employees at Service Ontario centres go through rigorous screening process and receive constant training to ensure that government services remain safe. Under Premier Ford, this government takes matters of consumer protection very seriously, and we will never stop taking action to protect Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker. Three years ago in June, the government posted a summary of proposals seeking feedback on how to improve the assigned VIN program. The stated objective was, quote, to reduce fraud and help recover stolen vehicles by preventing bad actors from fraudulently applying for an assigned VIN, end quote. I don't know what you learned or what you did with it, but things are not getting better. Provincial centres like Service Ontario do not have a system that checks if VINs already exist in other jurisdictions. In Ontario, someone can steal a car, register it, make quick cash, and be good to go. So my question is, what is this government doing to protect the VIN registry and Ontarians from car thieves? Again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, there was a, an incredible announcement with the Minister of Transportation, and I was there. One thing we're doing in sending a message for people who think it's okay to steal cars is we're going to keep your license suspended. You do it once, it's 10 years. You do it twice, it's 25 years. You do it at three times, you're gone. There's no more, no more uh, way of getting it back. So when it comes to fighting auto theft and understanding how serious it is, when it comes to understanding that there's never been a government that has taken public safety more seriously, to work with stakeholders, to work with the auto manufacturers, to work with police services, it is this government that's standing up for public safety every day. Here, here. The next question. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the High Energy Minister. <clears throat> sorry, the Minister of Energy. Uh, the Liberal carbon tax continues to drive up the cost of living for all Ontarians. Families in my riding in Brampton North and across the province are paying more for everything, from fueling their cars to feeding their families. What's even worse, Speaker? Is that there's no end in sight for this tax. The federal liberal, Liberals are planning to nearly triple the carbon tax by 2030. While the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal caucus are in favour of making life more expensive for families, they've never seen a tax they didn't like. Our government is fighting back against the Liberals' unjust tax schemes. Speaker, can the Minister please explain how our government is standing up for Ontario families putting more money back into their pockets? Minister of Energy. 
Uh, thanks uh, to the member from Brampton. Uh, it's great to get a question that was tough but fair from him this morning. Unlike the NDP and the Liberal caucus and the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, we're against a carbon tax in Ontario. Now, the Greens, the Reds, the Oranges, they're in favour of a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, and his families are getting out on the road this summer. You know, maybe the Liberals will be getting into their minivan and traveling to southwestern Ontario to visit their members down Oh, hold on. They don't have any members in southwestern Ontario, so they won't be going to visit their members. But it's going to cost them a lot more to fuel up that minivan. And families are fueling up their minivans. It's going to cost them more energy costs, gasoline costs, grocery. It's all going up, Mr. Speaker. The, the Premier Ford team here in Ontario is making life more affordable for the people of Ontario, cutting taxes, cutting fees, cutting tolls, cutting the carbon Response. tax, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thanks, the minister, for that answer. And I'll, I'll note, you know, the, the Liberals don't have any members in Brampton either. And we've got uh, Duncan here from Brampton North. I know the Liberals support the carbon tax. I really hope that they change their tune and they finally call Justin Trudeau in Ottawa and ask him to scrap this ridiculous tax. It's Speaker, Liberals can tout the carbon tax as a solution all they want. They're not fooling anyone, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax only punishes Ontarians by driving up the cost of daily necessities, making it harder for families to get by. Order. Our government knows that Ontarians deserve better. That's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have a plan to build our clean energy advantage. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is securing a clean, reliable and affordable energy future for all Ontarians without a carbon tax? The Minister of Long-Term Care will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Energy can reply. Thanks uh, to the great member from Brampton for the question this morning. He's absolutely bang on, and we do have a plan for powering Ontario's growth, Mr. Speaker, and seeing the types of investment that the Minister of Economic Development and Premier were at yesterday in the Niagara region. Multi-billion dollar investments are coming back. It's because we're cutting the costs of doing business and making life more affordable for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. While the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is in full support of the federal carbon tax, we are not. And I know we've got some good folks here from rural Ontario that are going to the pumps every day. We've got some beef farmers here from Gray County as well, and the cost of them doing business is going up billions of dollars over time because of the increased carbon tax. It's only going to continue to keep going up and up and up. We're making life more affordable. I know the member from Brampton really loves the one fare that's been brought in for transit riders. It's going to cut the cost by $1,600 a year. We've cut the gas tax 10.7 cents a litre, making life more affordable, cutting license plate ticker, sticker fees, cutting taxes. You've got to be really careful. Uh, Thank you. I apologize to the member for Kitchener, or sorry, uh, Kingston and the Islands for making him wake. I recognize him with the next question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in late 2021, COVID-19 cases skyrocketed in the Kingston area with the Omicron variant. An enterprising local doctor, Elaine Ma, ran a drive-through mass vaccination clinic. Community members, like my own daughter, volunteered to help. Thousands were quickly inoculated during a critical couple of days. That's why I was shocked when I learned that OHIP asked Dr. Ma to pay back uh, its $600,000 reimbursement. Why? OHIP said, because shots were given in the St. Lawrence College parking lot, not in her, in her office. Mr. Speaker, this is a follow-up to a letter to the minister's office that I sent several months ago. Does our government have the backs of doctors who think out of the box and take the initiative to protect us during health emergencies? Would the minister intervene and override OHIP's action and offer a fair solution? The government House uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we'll look into that. I know in my own uh, in my own riding, uh, uh, we had a, a drive-through uh, vaccination clinic, which worked uh, which worked very well. It really the, the the COVID pandemic really highlighted the failure of the previous Liberal government to do anything about health care. Right? The reason we had some of the lockdowns, the longest lockdowns Order. in North America, is because Order. the Liberals left us with such a crumbling, decaying 
health care system. And you know who supported them every Order. step of the way? was the NDP. So in 2011, the Liberals cut the health care budget when the federal government increased it by 6%. You know who supported them? The NDP. In 2012, the Liberals cut funding to small hospitals and rural areas across the province of Ontario. You know who supported them? The Order. NDP. In 2013, Bonds. the Liberals cut medical school uh, admissions. You know who supported them? The NDP. On every measure, you support them. The member will take his seat. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, this is this is not a really a partisan question. OHIT asked Dr. Ma to repay about six hundred thousand dollars in reimbursement for costs incurred. Six hundred thousand dollars is about the cost of for one COVID patient to stay a couple of months in the ICU. So that drive-through clinic was really a really cheap way to vaccinate thousands and prevent many additional COVID-19 patients uh, going to the ICU. Dr. Ma followed the rules, the steps to qualify her mass clinic under the prescribed GQ&H billing codes and OMA billing practices for mass clinics. She is being punished for no good reason. The Minister of Health has the power to conduct a post-payment review. Will she intervene today? Will she set a healthy precedent so that in our next public health emergencies, doctors who take the initiative to protect us in good faith can count on support from the system? You can Thank you to the member for Kingston the Island. Order. Order. Government House Leader. In my own home community, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Pearl Yang did the exact the member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Orleans will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. Sorry, apologize to the government house leader. Pearl Yang and Stovall did the exact same thing, uh, Mr. Speaker. So we'll look into that. But it's no, it's it's really telling that the member for Ottawa South is yelling, right? Because while he was here and he supported uh, that previous Liberal government that year after year after year cut health care funding, supported by the NDP, this is a member who was an absolute failure when it came to delivering for his own community. You know who's rebuilding Geo, the Children's Order. Hospital of Eastern Ontario? It is. This government. Well, that member sat there and supported a government that built no long-term care homes in his own community. In his own community, it is this government which is building more long-term care homes in his own riding than they built province-wide. Order. Order. The next question: the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Groceries are getting too expensive. People cannot afford to feed themselves and their families. Over the past year, almost a million Ontarians access food banks. It's evident that big grocers are jacking up prices under the cover of inflation and posting excess profits outside the historical norm. The Premier has a choice to make. Are you going to stand with the big grocers like Loblaws and Walmart? Or are you going to do your duty and protect the public from greed? Finance. the Minister of Finance to reply. Mr. Speaker, for that acknowledgement. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the, the member opposite. And, uh, I thought we went through this a little bit. We understand that many are hurting in this province. In fact, our budget, which we'll be voting on very shortly, talks about affordability, talks about helping not only families but businesses in this province. And Mr. Speaker, I listened to the learned Minister of Energy just a few seconds ago talk about the hardship that increasing the carbon tax and the price of gas has on not just the beef farmers that are here, but all the farmers across Ontario who are producing that food. And it's harming the people who have to ship that food right across the province and ultimately harming the people who have to buy the food, Mr. Speaker. This government cut the gas tax. We continue to make life more affordable here, here. for businesses and people. It's that government, Response. this government, and that opposition who should lock arms and vote for the budget here, here. to make vote life more budget. affordable. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Supplementary question, the member for Temiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. It's pretty obvious that Ontarians are having a hard time buying groceries. That's why they're being forced, people with jobs being forced to go to food banks. You know who else is having a hard time? The farmers who actually produce the food. They're having a hard time paying their bills. Who else? The processors are having a hard time 
making their margins. But you know who isn't having a hard time? The monopolies who control the grocery business. Their profits are going up higher than inflation, and they keep going up. The monopolies who this government seems to be the gatekeepers of. <laughs> because they support it very much so. They want to give them as much business as they can. At what point is the government of Ontario actually going to protect the people who produce the food and the people who consume the food from the monopolies? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would respectfully submit to the member opposite if that if, if he really cared for farmers, the best thing he could do is support our budget Thank because you. we are bringing so much relief all across Ontario thanks to the Minister of Finance because he is engaging all of us in terms of making sure Ontario remains affordable. And talking about affordability, we need to recognize, yes, we have amazing beef farmers of Ontario in the House today. And I would like to share with you that they were part of a rally on April 2nd that was hosted by the President of the Treasury Board in Holland Marsh because they came together with 25 other farming and rural organizations to stand up with the Premier and myself to send a direct message to the federal Liberals as well as Response. the carbon tax, Bonnie Crabbe. And that message is simple. Scrap the tax. Member for Kitchener Conestoga will keep the budget in the desk for the remainder of the question period. <laughs> the next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Two days ago, the TTC faced a massive service disruption, with Line 2 being out of service for 12 hours. Thousands of people were impacted as they were crammed onto shuttle buses that could not meet demand. Commute from Scarborough were more than doubled. And do you know what we heard from this government? That's right, nothing, because this government doesn't take responsibility for its failures. They talk a big game, but when their neglect becomes clear, they can't face it. They don't want to face the nurse who missed the shift or the patient who can't see the doctor because they couldn't make it in on time. Will this government continue to pass the buck on reliable and safe transit, or will they actually provide the TTC Order. with the funding Ontarians really need? And to apply, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has done more for transportation and transit infrastructure, and also making transportation more affordable than any other government in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to provide funding for all the municipalities through gas tax program. Millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, for transportation, repairs, expansion. Mr. Speaker, when we brought the uh, legislation to make sure that we built Ontario Line, Young North Subway Extension, Scarborough Subway Extension, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals and NDP Order. said no and voted against us, Mr. Speaker. When we brought one fair program Order. that saved $1,600, Mr. Speaker, Liberals and NDP said no, voted against it, not just once, Mr. Speaker, they voted against us twice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the House will come to order. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, what is clear about this government is that there is only one train that's properly funded in this province, and that it runs right through the Premier's office. That's right. This Premier gravy train never shuts down because he has no problem providing millions of dollars for his staff and his insiders. We know where their priorities are. It's not in making Ontarians have public services they can rely on. It's not ensuring that they can get to work on time. It's on making sure that checks get cleared on time. Under this government, we have seen massive delays to the subway, bus services cut, fares increases, and the Scarborough RT derail. Through you, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier commit to funding the operations of the TTC so it runs on time, or will he continue to let Toronto Transit riders down? Bravo. The Associate Minister of Transportation. 
Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the priority and what's happening under this government, Mr. Speaker. Under this government, Mr. Speaker, we are cleaning up the mess, the 30 years of inaction, and Mr. Speaker, last 15 years, Liberals did nothing. In Scarborough, we are building Scarborough Subway Extension, Mr. Speaker. We are building a brand new hospital yeah. in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. They have water against us, Mr. Speaker. And we are building the first ever medical school in Scarborough after 1983. And liberals chose to vote against us, Mr. Speaker. We won't take lessons from liberals and NDP who did nothing to Ontario, Mr. Speaker. After tw last 12 years ago, they decided to shut down Northlander, Mr. Speaker. Guess what? Under this government, under this premier's leadership, we are bringing back Northlander into our Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Stop. Members, will please take those seats. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I ask my, my, my question, I just want to say to the Minister of Energy, Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. All that the federal Liberal carbon tax is doing is making it harder and taking money out of people's pocketbooks. In Northern Ontario, these are the economic challenges are getting harder in every community. At the gas pump alone, this is a punitive tax that's hitting everyone. Communities across Northern Ontario continue to face more and more challenges that way. The cost of transporting goods is already much higher in Northern Ontario, and these costs are being passed on to the consumer. But, Speaker, the federal Liberals just are not listening. In fact, they increased the carbon tax, tax last month by 23 per cent and plan to hike it six more times before 2030. Question. That's completely unacceptable. Speaker, could the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development please tell the House how this carbon tax adversely affects the people of Northern Ontario? The Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Peterborough for Arthur for his gr a great question. Listen, we think it's a great policy objective of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund as its chair uh, to support community enhancement programs, Mr. Speaker. This program is focused on places like so the South Porcupine Arena, where we're putting supporting refrigeration equipment, compressors and condensers and dehumidifiers to become more energy efficient, Mr. Speaker, and drive down costs. The township, uh, Pointe aux Burials Communi Community Centre, increasing their energy efficiency, and the Warren Warncliffe Local Services Board energy efficiencies for their fire hall and community hall are all good things to do for our buildings that mean so much to our communities in Northern Ontario. What they can't handle, Mr. Speaker, is the crushing costs of the carbon tax. As the Minister of Natural Resources Response. and Forest might say, a fully integrated tax chain, Mr. Speaker, on everything, yeah. including the construction and implementation of these energy efficient things. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. The reality is the carbon tax does not lower a single emission. It's a useless tax that just makes it harder on families and businesses. Speaker, it's shameful that the federal government continues to force people in the north to pay more for their daily necessities. It's fine for the Liberal elites in southern Ontario to say, just use public transit, but, Speaker, how does somebody in Whitefish Bay, Elizabeth or Emo hop on a subway. The federal Liberals must learn to respect northern communities and finally scrap this punitive tax. Speaker, can the minister further elaborate on the detrimental effects the carbon tax is having on communities all across northern Ontario? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the lineage of this carbon tax is well documented. It actually predates uh, Justin Trudeau, it was Stefan Dion who tried to introduce it. Canadians said uh, no, Mr. Speaker, but he couldn't hold back 
when he became prime minister, he brought in the carbon tax. So this is all en famille, okay? Ah, oui. And and one of the biggest supporters was Bonnie Crombie, who has now rightly uh, lived up to the appellative term queen Appellative. of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. No surprise from a party that referred to Northern Ontario as a wasteland. No I referenced some projects in the previous answer, Mr. Speaker, and the point here is that no government should be in the business of picking and choosing the kinds of energy efficiencies or the sources of heat and hydro in different regions across Canada, Mr. Speaker. The goal here is to scrap the tax, Bonds. let jurisdictions make good policy decisions on how we can reduce GHG emissions, Mr. Speaker, and have more energy efficiency and maintain the assets of our small Order. 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 The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. Erwin Long lived at 73 Cartwright Street in London for five years until a company bought his home. After the sale, he was given two weeks to move out. When he couldn't find a new home, the landlord changed the locks, boarded up the windows and forced Erwin into homelessness. He slept in a parking lot. Despite the landlord and tenant board ordering the landlord to pay $6,700 for the illegal eviction, Irwin has never been compensated and he's never been able to return to his home. Ontario's eviction laws are weak enough. Without enforcement, they are useless. Renters want to know, when will this government begin to enforce its own eviction laws? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Mr. Speaker, we have a robust set of rules that are independent and available to both landlords and to tenants, Mr. Speaker. And the, the member opposite has highlighted an example where the Landlord Tenant Board had a hearing, had a result, Mr. Speaker, and there, there are remedies. And so, Mr. Speaker, I would, I would advise the member opposite to work with their constituent to uh, work within those rules that are independent, uh, not to be meddled with by, uh, by the government. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure they will have a proper resolve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you. I'm concerned that the Attorney General didn't even listen to the question. The, the individual has not been able to get the money that he is owed because the LTB is not enforcing its own rules and decisions. Today, Irwin's home at 73 Cartridge Avenue has been renovated and listed on Airbnb for $110 per night, plus taxes and fees. I don't believe, we don't believe investors like Irwin's landlord should be kicking out tenants and converting properties into pricey short-term rentals. It is contributing to Ontario's housing shortage and driving up the rate of illegal evictions. My question is to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. Will this minister crack down on short-term rentals in investment properties so that these homes can be returned to the long-term rental market? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I assure you, I was listening to the question very intently, Mr. Speaker, and, and the Landlord-Tenant Board is, is issuing orders uh, within 30 days, 90 per cent of the time at this point, Mr. Speaker, so they are, in fact, doing their job on that end, but maybe the member misunderstands that the Landlord-Tenant Board is not an enforcement agency, Mr. Speaker. It's a tribunal that issues, uh, has independent hearings and then issues orders, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. you know, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, to engage with the member opposite to, to uh, help educate her office on how the Landlord-Tenant Board works, Mr. Speaker, uh, but other than that, I don't know what else I can do for her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Uh -huh. Small businesses in my riding of Oakville are concerned about the negative impacts of the carbon tax on their operations, and they're worried indeed about their very survival. Absolutely. It's forcing entrepreneurs to pay increased costs that they cannot afford, especially during these difficult inflationary times. Speaker, our small business owners do not support these counterproductive tax measures. Unlike the NDP and Liberals, our government understands the financial burden that the carbon tax places on businesses. And that's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are reducing the cost for families and businesses. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government's pro-business approach ensures Ontario small businesses are saving money despite the burdensome carbon tax. Great question. 
the Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Oakville for his question. Speaker, while the federal Liberal government remains fixated on more taxes that punish hardworking Ontarians and businesses, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is getting it done for businesses and the families and communities that rely on them. Unlike the Liberals, we understand that more taxes and red tape strangle economic growth and job creation. That's why we've launched meaningful initiatives to reduce costs and cut red tape for entrepreneurs and businesses right across our province. We've cut business education tax rates and reduced electricity costs. We've reduced WSIB premium rates without reducing benefits. Speaker, we are directly tackling the payroll expenses that weigh on our job creators. Speaker, while Barney Crombie and the Liberals believe businesses are better Spons. off with more taxes, we're doing all we can to deliver fewer costs and more benefits. It's time for the Liberals to do the same. Tell Ottawa to scrap the tax now. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I really appreciate the answer uh, from the Minister of Small Business. She certainly understands small business, unlike the members opposite in the Liberal Party. And unlike the members of the Liberal Party in this legislature, we here believe that Ontario families and small businesses are not better off with a carbon tax. Speaker, they're not better off with increased operating costs, making it harder for them to stay afloat. They're not better off with increased gas prices, making it harder for consumers to come out and support them. And they're not better off being forced to pay the most carbon taxes that, while they haven't seen a dollar in promised rebates. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy here in Ontario. I don't know why the members of the Liberal Party and the Bonnie Crombie do not understand that. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister please tell the House how our government is working to offset the negative impacts of the carbon tax on small businesses right here in the province of Ontario? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the, the great member for his question. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. It's tone deaf for the Ontario Liberals to say small businesses across Ontario are better off under the federal government's punitive carbon tax. The NDP and the Liberals don't hear when small businesses in their own ridings are being crushed under the weight of higher carbon taxes. But maybe they'll be opened their ears after taking two losses back to back in Milton and Lambton Kent, Middlesex. Speaker. Those wins are a resounding vote of confidence for our Premier and our government's plan to continue getting it done for the people of this province. Ontario's job creators do not want another tax. They want an affordable entrepreneurial landscape that allows them to invest, to grow and create opportunities. That's precisely what our government is delivering through our strong economic plan for a stronger province. But you know what? It's not too late. Call the feds. Tell them to scrap the tax now. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I've now three members that want to raise.